When we make measurements in science, we want to make sure that they are both precise and accurate. The difference between the two is that with precision, you want to make sure that your measurement is repeatable. Um, with accuracy, you want to make sure that your measurement is very close to the true value or the correct value. So one way to look at precision versus accuracy is to look at some results. So um, when I was in college, I did a lab where I was given a solution and I had to figure out how much of that solution was um, a specific compound. So all of the students did this experiment and they did it in triplicate, meaning that they did it three times. There were awards given to students who were the most precise and then there were awards given to the students who were the most accurate. So if I look at these results, Rebecca got these three results for her three experiments. Perry got these three results for his three experiments. We did not know what the actual answer was, only our professor knew. So let's assume that in this case, the actual amount of that compound in the solution was 0 0.500 grams. If I know this, then I can decide which one is more precise and which one is more accurate. Rebecca re was able to repeat her results m very closely many times, so she was more precise. Perry's results are not as precise or as close together, but they are closer to the actual amount. So out of these results, Rebecca is more precise, Perry is more accurate. Another way to look at this is visually. So here I have a cornhole board, and these squares are representing the bean bags that have been thrown. So if I assume that Rebecca and Perry have both thrown three bean bags, Rebecca's are here at the bottom of the board, very close together. Perry's are not as close together, but they are closer to the hole, which is the goal of cornhole. So in this case, Rebecca is more precise because she repeated the same throw. Perry is not as precise, but he is more accurate because he is reaching the goal. So when we talk about precision, we also talk about something called significant figures, which is also called significant digits. A significant figure is any digit that carries meaning. So we've all been in math class where we put an answer or put a calculation into our calculator and we get this really long answer. We don't know where we're supposed to round it or which numbers are important. This is going to describe for us which ones are actually important or meaningful. So significant figures gets um, abbreviated oftentimes as sig figs. So the more significant figures a measurement has, the more precise that measurement is. So if I have two balances, and one of them tells me that the mass of an object is 0.65 grams, and the other one tells me that it is 0.648 grams, this one is the better piece of equipment. It is more precise. It told me more information about the mass of that object. Now, when we look at numbers or measurements, we need to determine how many significant figures there are. And there are, depending on where you look, about five or eight rules that I could have you memorize, but we're not gonna do that. We're gonna focus on one rule, which is called the Pacific Atlantic Rule. Okay, so I have a picture of the United States drawn here. The Pacific Ocean is on the west side, and the Atlantic Ocean is on the east side. The location of those oceans is going to help me figure out how many significant figures my number has. So first I need to decide, is there a decimal point or not in the number? So let's use 309 grams first. Is there a decimal point in that answer? No. So we would say that the decimal point is absent. Absent and Atlantic both start with an A and they are on the right side of the United States, which means when I count my significant figures, I'm gonna start on the right side. So I'm actually gonna look at the number nine first. 
Once I've decided that, I'm only going to start counting with a number other than zero. Well, that first digit is a nine, a number other than zero, so I'm going to count that. And then I'm not going to stop counting as once I've started. So as soon as I start counting with that nine, I'm going to count any digit after it. Whether it's a zero or another, another number than zero, I will count it. So this number has one, two, three significant figures. My second number, first of all, do I have a decimal point? No, the decimal point is absent. So I'm going to start on the right hand side of the number. The first digit I see is, is a zero. I cannot start counting with that, so that zero does not count. The next digit is a four. I can start counting with that, and I'll count all the way to the beginning of the number now. So the four counts and the two counts. So this number only has two significant figures. Let's look at this number. This number has a decimal point, so the decimal point is present. That means I need to start counting on the left-hand side of the number, again, starting with a number other than zero. My first digit is a two, which is a number other than zero, so I can count that. I'm gonna count that all the way to the end. So I count one, two, three, four significant figures. Notice that these two numbers are the same. They're both 240. This one only had two significant figures. This one has four significant figures. Whether or not there's a decimal point, and depending on how many zeros come after that decimal point, makes a large difference in the number of significant figures. My last number has a decimal point present, which means I'm gonna start on the left-hand side of the number. So I'm gonna start with this zero. I cannot start counting with a zero though, so I'm gonna skip that. I'm gonna skip the next zero, but the next digit is a three. So I'm going to start counting with that one, and I have one, two significant figures. So notice these zeros did not count, but this zero does count. It all depends on which side you start on, and it depends on where you start counting. So to go back to what I was talking about before, about rounding answers, the reason that we would want to round an answer is because our calculations can only be so precise. So what I mean by that is, when I take a measurement and then do calculations with those measurements, I'm gonna get all kinds of crazy long answers in my calculator. But that answer can only be as precise as my measurements were. So if I am multiplying or dividing those numbers, my answer is limited by how many significant figures there were in the original measurements. If I am adding or subtracting, then my answer is limited by how many decimal places the original measurements had. So here's an example. If I'm figuring out the area of a tabletop, I'm going to take the length of it times its width. So let's say that I measure its length with a meter stick. And so therefore I have this measurement. And then for the width, I decide that I'm just gonna kind of eyeball it and, uh, and estimate that it's 90 centimeters. This number is obviously more precise than this number. This number has four significant figures. This number only has one significant figure. So I'm gonna multiply them together, and this is what my calculator would say, but I need to round that appropriately. So this has four significant figures and this has one. Whichever number is lower, that's how many significant figures my answer needs to have. So I am limited to only one significant figure in my answer. So I have to round this to just 20,000. That is still one significant figure um, because I only had one significant figure in that particular measurement.